Well, hey fans of Biblical Genetics, this is Dr. C. I'm coming at you today from one of my favorite little bouldering spots in Atlanta. It's called Boat Rock. It's a neat place to come try out your rock climbing skills and some of the you know, beautiful granite boulders we have right here. I'm actually on my way home from the Atlanta airport, so you probably hear some planes flying over uh, as I'm speaking. I just got back from a really neat trip to Indiana, spoke at some really nice churches, met some really good people, had a really good time. You know, I love my job. In fact, I love my job a whole lot. I can't believe I get to do this. But I wanted to spend some time talk to you. And today's subject is another mystery. It's the mystery of how your cells can produce a couple of hundred thousand different proteins using only a few tens of thousands of genes. It's actually a giant mystery. It took us a while to figure it out. You see, back when I was in college, we had this thing called the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Bacterial genes are really simple. They have a specific starting point, and then the DNA runs for a while, and then there's an end point. And the cell makes a copy of the DNA as RNA, and then translates it from the stop to the end into protein. Very simple. That's not that way in any higher organisms. Anything more complicated than bacterium, there are things in the middle of the gene. They're called introns. They're part of a gene that doesn't code for protein. And so when the cell has to make a protein, it first makes a copy of all that DNA, and then it cuts out the introns and throws them away. Of course, some of those introns are functional. Some of them contain entire genes, but okay, we're gonna skip over that. They, it, basically, the cell gets rid of those introns and it joins those pieces called exons together, and the exons in a line code for a protein. So even though we know that higher organisms have more complicated genetic things and bacteria do, we still had the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis until the human genome was first sequenced. In fact, it was a big mystery. The first papers came out about the human genome. Everyone was expecting this huge number of genes. And they said, oh, maybe 22,000, maybe 23,000. Now what? How can we possibly make so many proteins if we only have that many genes? And they looked and looked and looked, and sure enough, they couldn't really find any more. Well, it took a little while of sleuthing. And what we found is that, how do you say it? There's a splicing and dicing code in the genome. In fact, in the areas that they would have called junk DNA before, it turns out that at the end of the intron, right where it joins to an exon, the intron part has all these little codes in it, 10 to 14 letters long, that says, hey, cell, use this exon in this gene under these conditions, but in under other conditions, don't use this exon. In fact, an exon now can be found in all different genes. In fact, genes that have nothing to do with one another. So we don't even have a definition of the word gene anymore because the parts of different genes are recycled in this really crazy complex system called the splicing code. To make it even worse though, the end of the exon that codes for protein there are codes in there also that say, hey, use this exon here and here and here, and, oh, by the way, this is a splice site between an exon and an intron. Oh, and by the way, uh, these letters here code for specific amino acids. So those amino acid coding areas code for three things at the same time. So you can't just randomly mutate it. You can't just change it willy-nilly because you might have some massive problems. You might affect more than one thing. In fact, the overlying interleaved nature of genetic information is a massive puzzle, not for creation, but for naturalism. For ideas that it came about all by itself. It's really hard to explain. But looking at the intron side of it, the introns used to be called junk DNA. But we're finding more and more features for the non junkiness of what we used to think were junk DNA. That doesn't mean that every single letter in the genome does something. It doesn't all have to code for protein. Most of it codes for RNA. In fact, your cells are not protein computers. Mm -mm. They're actually RNA computers. Most of the calculations and most of the decision making in your cell is done at the level of the RNA. And it's RNA that doesn't get translated into protein. Oh, that's really cool. So as we learn more about the genome, we learn all these crazy things, things that aren't supposed to be true. And the more complex the cell becomes, the harder it is for evolution to explain it. In fact, if life were really, really, really simple, it might be possible to explain life using evolutionary terminology. But the more complex it becomes, the harder it is for any evolutionary scenario to handle it. 
end, when we get into the point where we have overlapping languages and overlapping codes in the same set of letters, this is becoming a notoriously difficult nut to crack for those who try to explain it naturalistically. Now, I have no problem thinking that God created it this way. I have no problem thinking that an intelligent engineer engineered some really brilliant engineering into this genome. In fact, I kind of like that thought, and it kind of goes right along with the idea of biblical genetics. Hmm. Well, if you like this sort of stuff, we got a lot more coming. Tons of ideas, tons of things that, are, that I'm going to throw at you. I'm going to throw all these curveballs. I'm going to try to keep on challenging you to think. And some of the things I'm going to ask you to think about I'm going to actually challenge your biblical understanding of things. If you're already a Christian and you think you know your Bible, oh, I'm going to throw some curveballs at you because it's fun. It is fun to wrestle and it's fun to come up with new ideas. It's fun to think about the implications of some of the things that we're trying to discuss. But as far as the complexity of genome goes, guys, girls, it's massively complex. It's not simple. It's not easy. But you know what? We have so much more to learn. If you want to get into science, today's a great time to get into science because our understanding of things is exploding and research dollars are just being thrown at this problem. There's tons of money out there in different laboratories for working on these projects. And the more we learn about computers, the more we learn about the DNA. In fact, the more we learn about genomes and DNA, um, probably the better our computers are gonna get because we're gonna understand how to handle information in very complex ways that aren't, weren't intuitively obvious until we started looking. So anyway, that's just an introduction to the splicing and dicing code. You can find an article I wrote on this on creation.com. You just go to creation.com, type in maybe Carter splicing. It'll come right up. Uh, I'll also put a link in here to that and, that and a few of the references that I used for this in the show notes. So you can go to biblicalgenetics.com. I'd really appreciate your support. Just a like, thumbs up, a share would be awesome. Subscribing to our podcast or to our YouTube channel would be fantastic because I can't do this without you. But we're having a great time here. Uh, our episodes are in production. This is number six. We got a whole bunch more coming. In fact, I'm, I'm having a hard time, again, deciding what's next. I just read a really interesting paper today or another one yesterday. I'm trying to think of, you know, when am I going to have an episode where I just talk about all these new discoveries from this, this week? But so far, I'm kind of majoring on things that are 10, 15 years old because I'm trying to lay down a background for understanding so that as we progress into this, we can get into some really, really fun and interesting things. So that's it for now. I'm going to go home. Got to stop by the grocery store and pick up some things because I haven't been home for a couple days. I'm sure the, the milk is spoiled. And um, have a great time. Thanks for your support again. Love you all. Bye-bye. Hey, I did it. 